night to stay warm rather than slept. It was that cold. And many soldiers froze to death that night. Which type of soldiers froze to death? Maybe. Both sides. What type of soldiers froze to death? Those that probably couldn't march, which meant they were wounded. So many of the wounded died, froze to death that night, because it got so bitter cold the night of the 13th. Well, that night that it got so cold, General John B. Floyd deserted. He lost his nerve and left the fort, leaving Buckner now in command and responsible to keep the fort from being taken. So that night, General John B. Floyd lost his nerve and fled the fort, leaving Buckner in command of the rebel forces. Why would he do that, other than the fact he was he was scared, but there's a specific reason you would run out on your men. What was he afraid of? Anybody want to guess? Why did he run? What? From maybe afraid of defeat. There's a specific reason. He wasn't even afraid that much, maybe, that he was going to be killed in battle. What was he afraid of then? No? What? You know, Naya, that's very close, and I haven't had many kids come to that. He was very concerned about the consequences if they lost, because he had served in the northern federal government prior to secession. And what was he afraid of if he got caught? Treason, and he would be hung. That's, that's very good, yes. He fled because he served in the union government, and he was terrified that if they captured him, they would hang him for treason. So he fled and left the fort the responsibility of General Buckner. Well, he knows that he's grossly outnumbered. Knows it. And he knows if he goes into battle the next day, what's going to happen? He's going to lose. And so he surrenders. Rather than fight the next day, Buckner surrenders to General Grant and the Union forces. He surrenders Fort Donaldson. Knowing he's vastly outnumbered, knowing he isn't going to win the next day, knowing his army's in bad shape because of the cold, his wounded have died, he surrenders. Now, if I'm fighting in a war against Nick, and Nick wins, who sets the terms of surrender? Nick does. Okay? And what are terms of surrender? I what do you think? Well, kind of, but terms of surrender sometimes might be, my terms of surrender to you, Nick, I, you, I, I'm going to reverse that, I meet you, my terms of surrender is, you will lay down your arms, I will let you go home, I will let you keep your horse so you can get home, and don't ever come back and fight against me again. Terms of surrender means that both sides get something, usually the one that wins gets more, but the one that loses gets a little. Well, in this particular instance, when General Buckner asked Union General Grant for the terms of surrender, Grant informed Buckner there would be no terms of surrender. He would accept Buckner's unconditional surrender only. Now, what's an unconditional surrender? What's a conditional surrender? What we just talked about. I'm going to let you keep your horses and you can go home. Unconditional surrender is what you get out of it. Nothing. Nothing. We're going to take you prisoner of war. We're not going to treat your wounded. You got your butt kicked. You're not getting anything out of it. That's the way it is. You lost to me. Too bad. Because of that comment to Buckner after the Battle of Fort Donaldson, General, U General Ulysses S. Grant became known by the nickname Unconditional Surrender Grant, which meant any time until the latter stages of the war that he defeated you, you could count on no conditions and surrender. He's kind of a hard acre. I said something else, but I had to get more of So he was a, he was a, kind of a hard acre. Okay, he was a hard man. Now, this was a horrible defeat for the Confederates. The Union lost 2,331 casualties. 2,331. That means that you were either killed, 
or wounded or captured. But in this case, you wouldn't be captured because they won, right? So there was 2,331 either killed or captured. That's what, that's what the Union lost. The Confederates' losses were devastating. First of all, 15,067 casualties for the Confederates, killed or wounded, because there was another 15,000 that were what? Captured. Taken prisoner of war. So 15,067 casualties, killed or wounded. 15,000 more were taken prisoner of war. So really the casualties, you could say, were 30,067 because killed, wounded, or taken prisoner. But I broke it up. 15,067 killed or wounded. Fifteen thousand prisoner of war. I watched just buzz because I got a text message. From McKinsey Country. It's her birthday today. I know. Now, on top of that, it wasn't only casualties. What else was in those forts? Weapons. weapons. Twenty thousand approximately weapons were captured. That would be guns, rifles, pistols, ammunition, etc. About twenty thousand weapons were captured that would be not in Confederate hands now, but in Union hands. What else might be in those forts other than weapons, like Horses. rifles and pistols? What? What? Who said something? <laughs> What'd you say? What'd you say? She said horses. Horses? <laughs> 3,000. Oh! They took 3,000 Confederate horses. Very good, my dear. Took 3,000 Confederate horses were taken that would now be serving the Union Army. Wow, brilliant. Nobody's ever said that. She's bomb stars going for the drama. She's going, you know what guys should have better self-esteem than that. What else would you find in a fort? Cannons. Cannons. They took 78. Excuse me. 48. Oh, wow. Not that you've got any eraser. They took 48 pieces of artillery, which are cannons as well. So 15,067 killed or wounded on the Confederate side. 20,000 prisoners of war, 20, 000, or excuse me, 15,000 prisoners of war, 20,000 weapons, 3,000 horses, and 48 pieces of artillery or cannons. That's a huge loss at Fort Donaldson. Really a huge loss. And obviously with that, you're almost got Tennessee, right? Almost. But they don't have them until the bloody... Battle of Shiloh, or the Battle of Bloody Shiloh. And that's what we're going to talk about right after that tomorrow, so put that subtopic down. The Bloody Battle of Shiloh.